We've been experiencing the effects of climate change in real time. The folks across the Midwest, our farmers, our producers, responded to the call to Congress. By the end of the decade, the population could grow by another half billion people and well over 10 billion by the turn of the next century. We face a monumental challenge. We must feed our planet's exploding population while eliminating dangerous greenhouse gas emissions into our atmosphere. New horizons are emerging in agriculture. New industries, new products, and advancements in processes and procedures that reduce carbon outputs and result in environmental improvements. Better water quality, healthier soil, pure air, and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. These positive changes in the way we produce food bring numerous ecological services and wildlife benefits back to our landscape. Our challenges aren't only environmental, they're also economic. Most folks know of the financial hardships felt by too many in our urban cities. But out here in the heartland, there's another kind of economic crisis. One resulting in boarded up downtown squares, crumbling infrastructure, underfunded schools, closed medical clinics, and a lack of high paying quality jobs. By telling the stories of individuals and organizations seeking to combat this downturn, we're gonna highlight how new opportunities in agriculture and renewable energy production can help solve the economic challenges facing small towns across the heartland while also bringing environmental improvements to our landscape. I'm Brandon Butler. Welcome to Prairie Profits. Out here in the heartland, where agriculture drives rural economy, we are on the path to a future that not only produces food, but also renewable energy, ecological services, and improved wildlife habitats. I'm on a journey to tell the stories of Horizon 2, a climate smart future for corn, soybean, livestock, and renewable natural gas production. I'm Brandon Butler, and this is Prairie Profits. I grew up in Northwest Indiana, where the urban sprawl of Chicago meets an endless expanse of agriculture. Just in my lifetime, I've watched many natural areas that I grew up hunting and fishing get engulfed by suburbia. That's led me to want to spend my life in conservation, to work to protect places that mean so much to people in rural America. One of the frustrations I've found, though, is the divide that often occurs between agriculture and conservation. Agriculture and conservation have to work hand in hand. And I never met anybody who brings those two together better than Rudy Raceline. Rudy's a true American dream. He came to this country as a young boy after World War II with his family. They started over with basically nothing. And through a series of successes, Rudy has built multiple companies into world-class organizations. Today, what he's doing to create renewable energy and to bring ecological services and wildlife benefits back to our landscape is truly remarkable. So much so that four years ago, I asked if I could join the team, and I've been super proud to be part of Raceline Alternative Energy ever since. Let's go meet the man behind this incredible company. Coming to America, at eight years old, from a foreign country. You didn't speak the language. You didn't know the culture. What was it like starting over in a, a whole new country? Especially where I came from. I lived in three different displacement camps. Just run down wooden barracks that American soldiers and had both horses and themselves in. And so 
coming to America was like, okay, this, this whole new world was going to open up. There was a lot of unknowns. Uh, I got here in August and uh, went right into school a couple of weeks later, like I said, without speaking a word of English. First couple of years were kind of tough. I mean, it was after World War II, so there were some sentiments against Germans. My mother, at 14 years old, got put on a train by my grandfather, Rudolf, and sent to Austria. And my grandfather said he'd see him in a few months, and uh, my mom never saw him again. You know, I grew up with a mother that was pretty strong, because at 14 years old, she kind of became the matriarch and really gave me a lot of the ethic, work ethics that I have, because she worked. I never looked at ourselves as being poor because I had this close-knit family that, you know, kind of worked through things and taught us that, you know, hard work will always give you what you need. Uh, I never dreamed I'd have a, a business that, you know, was international with locations all over the world and 1,200 employees and have the kind of financial means to do what I do back then, but, you know, it just came a little bit at a time. Rudy has built two incredibly successful businesses, but his love of nature, especially tall grass prairie, has driven his greatest challenge, turning his 2,000 acre Northern Missouri farm into the model of how conservation and agriculture can coalesce. Being raised in South St. Louis, Rudy sought out nature on the fringes of the city. Those early experiences along the Mississippi River are the roots of his passion for wildlife and wild places. You're a dedicated conservationist and really rooted in hunting and fishing. How did that passion come to be? You know, as a young boy, my mom said that I would frighten the hell out of her, especially when we lived at that convent. It was right on a small stream and I almost drowned twice diving in, trying to catch trout. Uh, but the other thing she said is that at four and five years old, if she turned around, I'd be gone. And I'd run off into the woods, then she'd be crying, thinking I'd be lost. But a couple hours later, I'd come back with a handful of flowers. You know, I've had this affinity for, especially in Germany and in Austria, they call these prairies Wiesens. And so we had a lot of native in Austria, beautiful meadows. And I would go to those, I'd be attracted to those meadows. Uh, but when I got to the U.S., I lived in the middle of the city, and eventually my dad gave me a bicycle. And when he gave me a bicycle, that gave me wings because I would just ride all over looking for creeks. And eventually I found the railroad tracks along the Mississippi River. Throughout the settlement and expansion of our country, nature took a backseat to economic growth. Today we are righting many of those wrongs by finding ways to make financial gains while also delivering environmental improvements. Can you explain how prairie, native grasses, and cover crops can be turned into energy? In 2015, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, classified manure uh, as cellulosic material that can be used to generate what's called D3 RIN. D3 RINs are uh, a value system of how much a million BTU of energy would be produced and what that's worth. So to produce that energy, this process called anaerobic digestion is a four-step biological process of which the last step is methanogens that make methane, uh, which is the same molecule that you have in natural gas. We capture that and then we find a pipeline that's close by, either a distribution or a transmission pipeline, and we run what's called an interconnect. And then because of the interconnection of our trillion dollar grid system that is extremely valuable for this country, we're able to sell that gas in California or other places in a virtual transaction. And because grasses are cellulosic, my vision is that we could take grasses and put them in the same type of anaerobic digestion process and make additional methane. So the vision is really to on this farm experiment with, you know, how much biomass can we make? We want to make gas, we want to have ecological services, and we want to have wildlife habitat.
Yeah, this is probably the showiest part of our farm right now. This is pretty. Oh, what a beautiful combination that is, huh? Yeah. Got the bergamot, got the grays. But I used to have a lot of those compass plants along here. So Queen Anne's lace, is that a invasive? Is that a non? It goes non out. Right? It's a non-native, but the thing about Queen Anne's lace, it, it only likes easy territory. But usually as your prairie gets maturity, it leaves. I mean, pretty, pretty fast. Frank Oberly is recognized as a pioneer in prairie restoration. He's been Rudy's mentor for converting hundreds of acres. The two have a special friendship, forged in a mutual love of native grasses and wildflowers. We're going to visit with Frank to learn more about his love of prairie and special bond with Rudy. Rudy Raceline gives you a lot of credit for inspiring his passion for prairie. Talk about your relationship with Rudy, how you guys came to know each other, and, and how this incredible company really was rooted in the idea of restoring 30 million acres of prairie. Rudy had called me and said he had a lot of questions about establishing some prairie, and our friendship began with that. I kind of helped him get a prairie at a central farm going. Since then, he and I have talked a lot about prairie. Rudy is um, damn near a savant when it comes to prairie. I thought I, you know, was pretty much up on it, but I'm all in. I haven't found anything that he wants to do with his prairie movement that, that isn't just a gift from God. I asked him once, I said, Rudy, when do you sleep? He goes, well, I don't really, Frank, but 30 million acres in 30 years, we would see a climate reduction in heat. We would see, I think, our polar caps getting a little chillier. I'd say our water was more healthy, and I think we, our farmers would be more productive. You know, when I was a kid, I used to hear this thing called, you're crazy as a man on the moon. Well, when I was, um, I think 18, I think I watched that man walk on the moon. So we need Rudy's. You know, Brandon, I've had in the last few years, I've had a heart attack, a stroke, and I still have that same zeal for prairies I had before. And as long as I see you guys out there, with some enthusiasm, I'm going to be a cheerleader and I'll be there on the sidelines, you know, saying, go, go. On a beautiful summer day, high school students from across the country who were part of Lincoln University's Minority University Research and Education Project came to Rudy's farm to experience nature and to sleep out under the stars. All right, welcome. Uh, what we're going to see today is a combination of agricultural land. Northern Missouri. I came out here because I wanted to learn about agriculture and get a deeper understanding of, you know, what goes on in it, what happens, how it affects climate. Nitrogen is another one that dissolves in water and it flows into our streams and lakes. This lake is an example of what I call what happens when you have ecological services that service the world and I'm really interested in a young person's perspective on climate change. It's like a big problem for everybody and people really don't do much about it. So I'm like, oh, okay, let's just check it out. Let's see what this camp has to offer. Maybe I could learn something new and maybe I could just find a new interest maybe or a new passion. Rudy is a teacher at heart, in life and in business. He's always ready and willing to give back. Whenever he has an opportunity to educate, especially young people, he takes it and delivers inspiration. We've traveled to one of Race Line's renewable natural gas production facilities on a Smithfield Foods farm near Unionville, Missouri. I speak with Professor Sugata Bardham to learn more about the program he is leading. What do the students experience through the program? 
Uh, so they will be exposed to various facets of climate change, uh, agriculture and ecosystem. They will learn about GIS and remote sensing. They will learn about alternative energy uh, at race line, alternative uh, energy uh, facilities. They will learn about big data, machine learning, and all kinds of uh, uh, cool uh, scientific uh, experiments they will do. And hopefully that will encourage them in, in a career in STEM. How do you think an interest in, in climate smart solutions in agriculture and forestry are changing with your generation compared to past generations? So I think we're a generation that sees like action has to take place, like we're starting to see the physical and very real effects in our lives with extreme weather. You know, our two options are one, be despaired, or two, take action. And I think we're exploring multiple avenues, like a lot of people go into like the tech world. I've kind of started myself with people who are like, how can we work with nature and sort of create that partnership beyond just the human connection, but with the plants and the ecosystems and the animals and really curate a landscape that is supportive of more of this climate smart practices. So that's the inlet. Obviously it comes up from the ground. Compressor gets compressed in the oil gas solution or mixture. So the gas comes in right here and it starts its way through all this different machinery. Seth Renfro is Raceline's operations manager across all the North Missouri farms. He leads a tour for the students to learn more about RNG production. This is what we call our dashboard. So this kind of has high level items that are going on with the plant. So if anything is problematic, we'll see it. So what you saw t today in the tour is my intent is to actually harvest every second or third year that cover crop and that grass and also use that in addition to the manure. The bacteria in the manure would inoculate those grasses and turn that into energy. So I look at my forest and my grasses and our cover crops as similar to a battery. It's stored energy. It's just in a different form. And so what these farms represent is the, what we call Horizon One, where we're taking animal waste and converting it to energy, but it's also doing very good environmental things because we're, we're stopping the escape of methane into our atmosphere that warms our planet. And you know what I'm hoping is that several of you will be inspired and say, I'd like to do that. Uh, I, I've mentioned we have a uh, internship program when you get to the point where you're seniors and ready to make some college career decisions. We love to hire young people that want to go into engineering. But it's not just engineering. We have business development. We have you know, the people that do our accounting. We have people in HR. So all of those kinds of opportunities are available for you young people when you decide you'd like to have an internship. And maybe when you get done with it, you say, well, that's not what I want to do. But it narrows down what you do want to do for the rest of your life. So I, you know, that's the message I give all of you. If you take away as you decide what you want to do. The big difference is that oftentimes people think about what's good for them. I always thought, like at Smithfield, what's good for Smithfield? And once you keep doing that, at the end of the day, those people, whether it's your friend or whether it's a business, they'll understand that you're not about yourself, but you're about everybody around you. And that makes you successful because they will make sure that with that relationships, it prospers. An old proverb states, a society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they shall never sit. At 74 years old, Rudy is still going strong, but he knows the future is in the hands of those who will pick up the torch and run with it. He's doing all he can to leave this earth better than he found it, and to ensure those after him do the same. You know, I, I grew up pretty serious because I looked at life and and what my parents struggled through. And we lived in an apartment upstairs in a flat, and it was right before Christmas. And uh, my mom and dad were talking about what the hell they were gonna get us for Christmas. And they didn't have doors, they didn't have walls. They had a, a blanket as a separation between my brother's room and my room. And I just wanted to scream, hey, I don't care about that. What makes me happy is the, the fact that we're all together and we care about each other and not whether you can buy me a little train set or buy me a Christmas present. So what makes me happy is when I see my employees fully engaged and they're passionate about our business and they realize they're making a difference and that the visions that I have 
are making a difference. This planet is so, so special. And so what makes me happy is, is taking problems and people looking at problems and turning it into opportunities that they never imagined. Horizon 2 is going to be a long and arduous journey to create a new market and to restore millions of acres of prairie is a monumental challenge. But with the team Rudy has assembled and the partners who have joined him, I believe it would be foolish to bet against this special man's vision becoming our reality.